Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Ecclesiastes, picking it up in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 today. At the beginning of this book, Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, the king, David's son, he, he's being real pessimistic, and, and he's saying, well, if I'm just going to die, the, 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 the wise man dies just like the fool, and if I'm just going to die like everybody else, what's even the point of me even getting wisdom? What's the point of me getting gain, getting riches, if it's just going to go away when I die? And that's the trap that so many people fall into because they don't think about God. They don't think about how our Heavenly Father actually loves us, how He wants us to be prosperous, how He'll do anything for us if you just love Him, if you try to serve Him. And they don't realize that the real treasure is awaiting in heaven when you just do your best in this life. I mean, you, you will get pleasures that and riches that are unimaginable when you get to heaven. And the thing is, you don't even have to wait till heaven. You can get blessed right now. I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, a scripture we've talked about quite often, says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has even come into the mind of a man the things that God has prepared for him that love him. So just be patient. Solomon's going to get it turned around. But at the beginning of this book, he's being real pessimistic. But then about verse 24 of chapter 2, he finally starts to get it. And he says that there's nothing better than for a man to eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor because it brings goodness to his soul. And remember, that, that's what we are after is, is food for our soul. It doesn't really matter the things we get in the flesh, but our spiritual body. And that what, what is the bread? We, we eat the living, the, the bread of life, which is Christ, which is the truth of his word. I mean, that's, that's what we strive to get, to get happiness. And he said that there's nothing better for me to enjoy the ways in this world. So God wants us to be happy in these flesh bodies. Remember, that's what this book of Ecclesiastes is. Written to the man that walks under the sun. Teaching us how to be happy in the flesh bodies. And we learn that there is a time and a purpose for everything. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to embrace with others. And then sometimes you've got to separate yourself from others, from certain people. So there's always a time and a purpose. And even in our day-to-day -day lives, even when we're at our jobs, God makes things happen so that we can become a better Christian, so that we can be a better of service to Him. And we basically ended how it says that, that, that there's wickedness in the place of judgment, which means the courts. People taking bribes, people not caring what's actually right, showing favoritism. And what's even worse, there's wickedness in the place of righteousness, which is in the church. I mean, people not even teaching God's word, just having all these traditions. And we're going to read about that today, how much God's against it. I mean, saying that perversion is okay. There's so much wickedness in many churches and that that will bring God down. I mean, God, his wrath is going to be poured out. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 4. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes that gives us so much wisdom about how to be happy and how to serve you. And we thank you for giving us this building so we have a place to fellowship with others in your name and to share your word with others exactly as it's written. And we just ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken tonight. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So, all right, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. And it reads, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. See, this is the situation that you're in if you don't have God on your side. If you don't love God, if you don't serve Him. You do have no comforter. The Holy Spirit doesn't abide in you if you don't love God. So, so you're really out here on your own. And then, yeah, people can have power over you. You might be oppressed because you don't have God to take care of your enemies for you. But if you have God on your side, if you love Him and you study His Word and you serve Him, He says that He'll take care of all of your enemies for you. That would be a horrible situation to be in to not have the comforter, the Holy Spirit, with us. Verse 2. Wherefore, I praise the dead which are, which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. 
And he's saying I, that, that the people are happier that are already dead than the people that are alive in a flesh body. And I mean, really, I mean, that's actually a fact. I mean, and I mean, we all can't wait to get back to our Heavenly Father, but we have work to do in these flesh bodies. Our job is to serve God, to share the love of Christ with others, and to plant seeds of truth of His Word when we feel led to. But Solomon's being real pessimistic. I mean, this is not a good mindset to have because what do we just read in the last chapter? There's nothing better for a man to enjoy his life in the flesh. And God lets us enjoy our, this life as long as we're doing the right thing. Verse 3. Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is, uh, that is done under the sun. He's saying that the person that's in the best spot is the people that haven't even been born yet that are still in a spiritual body with God that have not yet been born. Even, even they, he's saying they have the best because they haven't even seen the evil things that are going on in the flesh. And once again, this documents that before you were born in the flesh, you are with God in the spiritual body as you have always been before we were born. So, but remember, this is not a good mindset to have. Solomon, he's, had, he's getting real down here, but it, it is very easy to be optimistic when you have God on your side. Verse but he, he really, he's, he's kind of forgetting about God at this point. Verse 4. Again, I consider all travail, and that, that means trouble and sorrow, and every right work, that, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. And it, it is vanity and vexation of spirit when you envy your neighbor. I mean, one of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it says, Do not covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet his wife. Don't covet the things that he has. So, so that, that's a bad thing. That's not righteous. So we are, just like Paul would teach in the New Testament, we are to be content with everything that we have. I mean, everything we have is a blessing. And there's so many people that are worse off than you are. So just remember that. Be happy with everything that you have. And don't envy what other people have. Especially what, what this is saying, they envy the people that are blessed by God. And that's not a good idea. You don't want to do that. Verse 5. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. This means that he's so lazy that he, he just eats himself up. He, he just wastes away. And God does not like a person to be lazy at all. He wants his children to work. And I want to read a little bit more about people that are lazy in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 26. You got Proverbs right before this book of Ecclesiastes. Same author, Solomon, the wisest that there ever was. And we know that God is the real author, but Solomon penned it. So Proverbs chapter 26, verse 13, speaking of the people who are lazy. Verse 13, and it reads, The slothful or the lazy man saith, There is a line in the way. A lion in the streets. And who, who is the lion? Well, for, well, the real lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Jesus Christ. But remember, Satan copies Christ at every turn. And you could, you could read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where it says that your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom, whomsoever he can devour. So what this is saying, the, the lazy person, he, he sees Satan out there, but he doesn't do anything about it. He, he doesn't try to stand up against Satan. He, do, he doesn't care that Satan's hurting his brothers and sisters. He just sees all the wickedness going on and he doesn't do anything about it. Verse 14. And, and also in that 1 Peter chapter 5, it says that you resist the devil because you know that the same, you know that other people in the world, they are getting through the same things that you're going through with the help of Christ. So you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 14. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. The saying, all a lazy person does is just like a door, he just rolls over on his bed, just like a door on his hinges. He doesn't get up and he doesn't get up and walk out the door to go to work like a real man or woman is supposed to. But he just lays on his bed all day, just doing nothing, being lazy, not accomplishing anything. That's a wasted life if you do that. Verse 15. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. I mean, he's so lazy, he don't even want to feed himself. I mean, he doesn't want to go out and work for his money. He just wants the government to pay for him. He wants somebody else to take care of him. But you see, God is against that. Verse 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. A lazy person, I mean, he doesn't care what anybody else says. 
He thinks that he's right about everything. He thinks that he can get over on everybody else, rip people off, just get by through life, never have to work for anything. But God, God does not like a person who is lazy. He wants us to work. That's why we are here. And the main work, that we, we have to work to provide for our families. I mean, God's Word says a person who won't take of his family is worse than a heathen non-believer. But you see, the main work that we are to do is study our Father's Word. You do not want to be lazy when it comes to studying the Word of God. Or else you're going to be real caught off guard in many different ways. Okay, let's go back to Ecclesiastes and keep going. Chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. And it reads, Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Quietness means rest. So it's better just to have a little bit and you have rest. You have peace of mind. You're not, you're not always looking over your shoulder. You're not worrying about getting caught. But you, you can be peaceful at night. You can lay down your head knowing that God's on your side. You don't have to worry about anything. But then but to have both hands full with travail. Travail means worry. I mean, you can, you can never enjoy anything you have if you did it ripping somebody off. But it's always going to get taken away from you in the end. And you're never going to be able to enjoy it. So it's better to just have a little with peace of mind than a whole lot and with, with no peace of mind. Verse 7. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. Vanity meaning that emptiness, things that are unsatisfactory. Verse 8. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. This word sore travail, this could even be translated as bad business. The Greek word for that's translated sore here, that means bad, and travail means business. So it's bad business. If you don't if you don't have anybody to share it with, I mean you're just a workaholic. You even if maybe you have a family but you don't care about them. All you care about is work, it's just about getting paid. Then, then, then you realize that you have no one to share it with. And, and don't forget, but the, the main thing, e even if you're basically all alone in this world when it, as it comes to flesh, know that God is always with you and you are never alone when God is on your side. I mean, you pray to Him, you talk to Him daily, and you have that real relationship with our Heavenly Father, and you are literally never alone. But it is a true blessing to have other people in the flesh to share to share life with. Verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. After they work, I mean, they get to come home and, and enjoy each other's company. That's a, that's a blessing from Almighty God. Verse 10. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. And remember, you are never, ever alone when you have God on your side. He lifts you up. He gets you through any situation that you might go through. You're never alone with God on your side. Verse 11. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12. And if one prevail or overpower against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not broken. And you know what that threefold cord is? It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And nobody can break that. When you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is all one and the same, when you have that, nothing can ever come against you. You always have comfort. You always have peace of mind. Because you know you have the highest entity, the highest power looking after you and loves you individually. I mean, an actual, you, we could even call God a person if you want to say that. I mean, an actual entity that loves you and has the power to protect you over everything, has the power to bring you into happiness and prosperity, that can never be broken. Verse 13, Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. An old and no more be admonished, I mean, he won't listen to anybody. Thinks that, oh, I'm so, and this, this don't have to be a king. I mean, this could, this could apply to anybody. Anyone that thinks that they are so wise, they can't listen, that no one can tell them anything. And that's not a mindset that anybody should have. I mean, when you're studying God's Word, maybe with a small group of people, and the Holy Spirit is right there with you. 
And maybe some people that they've hardly never even maybe studied the Word of God, but that Holy Spirit moves and something might come out of your mouth that they're out of their mouth. You say, wow, they're exactly right. I mean, someone that maybe they don't have, hardly know anything about God's Word. But so don't ever think that you are too wise to learn from other people because when the Holy Spirit moves, God can use anybody to even teach you, even, you've been, even if you've been studying the Word for decades. So don't ever think that you are too wise to ever be admonished by somebody else. Verse 14, it better, be to, better to be poor and wise than to be rich and foolish. Verse 14, for out of prison he cometh to reign. Whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. And this could really, this kind of takes us back to two different places in the Old Testament. One would be Daniel. I mean, he was taken into captivity. But what happened in, in chapter 5 of the book of Daniel? Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, he, he was having the big drunken party with all the holy vessels. And then he just saw the hand start writing on the wall, meany, meany, tekel, you farce. And, and, then, and then what did Daniel do? He interpreted it. He said that your kingdom is weighed in the balance and your kingdom is going to be taken away from you. So what happened? Daniel was exalted to basically right under the king. I mean, he went from cap to captivity to basically being ruler over the whole realm. And then even, even when the Babylonians were taken over by the Medians and the Persians, Daniel was still up there in a high office. Why? Because what do we learn in the book of Jeremiah? Daniel followed God's plan. God told him, you are going to go into captivity to the Babylonians. But many of them, they just ran away. They didn't do what God said. So, so some of them got killed or they got taken into harsh bondage with no blessings. But Daniel followed God's plan and got exalted. And another even, even uh, another one is, um, is Joseph. We learn in the book of Genesis chapter 37 through 40. Where, 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 his own, where Joseph was having these visions, these, these, division, these visions directly from God. Tell, that, that would tell him that Joseph, Joseph was going to be ruler over all his brethren. And, and his brothers didn't like that. So they threw him down in a pit. They were going to kill him. They decided not to kill him. But then, but then, the, Ishmi, or then, the, then the Ishmaelites ended up getting him. And then the Ishmaelites sold Joseph into the, um, to Egypt. So, th so then you got Joseph over here in Egypt. I mean, he, the brothers all hate him, all wanted him dead. But, but what, what ends up happening? Joseph ends up getting exalted to right under Pharaoh. And Joseph at one point, I mean, Satan tried to get him there for a second when the wife of Pharaoh tried to lie with Joseph. And, and, but then jo the Joseph wouldn't do it. He said, no, he won't do it. So, so then he ran away, but then the Pharaoh's wife told a lie and said that, that he tried to lie with her. So Joseph was thrown into prison, even there in Egypt. But then what happened? God prevailed, the, tr the truth came out, and Joseph was exalted right under Pharaoh, I mean, ruler of the whole realm. So sometimes maybe, and, and remember, many of you, when you refuse to stand up against the false Messiah, you're going to be cast into a prison, but only for a 10-day period. And then, then that is when you will be delivered up, not premeditating what you will say, but to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. And then guess how much you're going to be exalted? Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. You will be priests and kings and reign with Christ for that thousand year teaching period and for all eternity. So a little sacrifice is well worth it for eternal blessings and glory. Verse 15. I considered all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. And what this has to do with this popularity, someone might be real popular for a second, but then all of a sudden people might decide they don't like that person anymore. I mean, popularity, you can't count on it. That's why it doesn't matter what men think of you. I mean, they might really like you one day, then they decide, oh, he's not as cool as I thought, now I'm just going to go over here to these other people. I mean, that's how, that's how the flesh works. That's how many people are. That's not how you are, but that's how a lot of people are. So the point is that you can't trust in, in what man think about you because they, they might change their mind. But guess who will never change his mind? It's Almighty God when you serve Him. Verse 16, There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in Him. Surely also this is vanity and vexation of spirit. And just, just like we've learned multiple times in this book, no, no one knows about you that, that lived that lived hundreds of years ago. I mean, even a even hundred years ago. I mean, those people, they don't know anything about you. You weren't even born yet. 
And then another hundred years goes by after we die. No one's really going to know about you at that time either. So what's the point? The, that riches of the flesh, that what people in the flesh think about you, it means nothing. Don't worry about getting treasures that were that were a moth and rust can corrupt them here on earth. But you seek after treasures that are eternal in heaven, that will, that will never be corrupted, that you will have forever, that eternal life. And God, God will never leave you or forsake you when many people in the flesh will. Let's go a little into chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1, book of Ecclesiastes. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. A whole lot in this verse. What's this mean to, to keep your foot? It, mean, it means that you better pay attention on where you're going. It means it means is and to keep it means to it means to protect to guard. So you better guard yourself, guard your soul when you go into a place that they claim to be a church, but they're not studying God's word. They don't. There's not even a Bible in sight. You better watch that, and when um, to be more ready to hear. That word "hear" in the in the Hebrew is shama, and it means to hear intelligently. And remember, it doesn't matter what any man says. It matters what the Word of God says. You go, to the, you go to a church to hear the Word of God intelligently. That's what you go for. Not to, hear, not to give the sacrifice of fools. And, and check out this word fools in the Hebrew. It means to be stupid. And that's exactly what it is when you're doing all these things that they seem so religious. But the Word of God is never taught. God says that you are giving a sacrifice of fools and you get no blessing from it when you go to a church that the Word of God is never taught. So you better be real careful. You better keep your foot, protect yourself from, from going to a place that, that people say, oh, I went to church today. Well, what did you learn today from God's Word? Well, nothing. Then you got no blessing out of it. You went to a place that was merely called a church, but it was really nothing. It was just men's traditions. So you want to be real careful. And they, they consider not that they do evil. Oh, yeah, we're praising God. We're praising Jesus Christ. And, and that, is an, that is an amazing thing. But, if, if, but what a church's job is to do is to teach God's word exactly as it's written. They consider not that they do evil. They think that they're doing all these things that seem religious, that it's good enough. But God says it's not good enough. Verse 2, be not rash with thy mouth. Be real careful what you say. And let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. You want to be real, real careful on things you say. And even if you're praying to God. I mean, I would hope that you would never get, get, a, get a bad tone with God. I mean, act like you're mad at God or something. I mean, pe people have tried that in the past. And God said, yeah, it does you real good to be mad. Go ahead. It doesn't do you any good. So you want to be real careful about what you say and how you act toward God and toward the others, of course. But remember, all that matters is God's will. It's not our will that really means anything. Well, let your words be few. A fool is known by a multitude of words. Verse 3. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business. That means that um, a dream, your goals can be completed by you working hard for it, by a multitude of business. Not by being lazy and just being like a door that goes from back and forth on the mattress, but by a multitude of business, by working hard, then your dreams can be achieved. And then you, you can sleep easy at night knowing you worked for what you have. And a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. And you've seen people that, I mean, they just talk so much. I mean, they love to talk, but they never actually do anything worthwhile. They talk it up a big game. I mean, you would, by the way they talk, you think they got a whole lot going for them. But they never actually do anything. And that's what a fool does. Remember this word fool in the Hebrew. It means to be stupid. And they're stupid when they speak a multitude of words and never do anything. Remember there's a time to speak. And there's a time to be silent. More often usually you want to be silent kind of. You want to, it, it doesn't do any good to brag on yourself being the point ever. Verse 4. And thou vowest a vow unto God. Defer not to pay it. If you promise something to God, you, you better come through on it. For, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Remember the word kesil in the Hebrew. It means to be stupid. Pay that which thou hast vowed. It would be real stupid for you to make a vow, a promise to God, and to not pay it. Verse 5. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow 
then that thou shouldst vow and not pay. It's really a whole lot better for you not to make any promise to God. I mean, it's unnecessary. Just do what's right. You don't have to promise anything to Him. Just do what is right. That is all God asks of us. Verse 6, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore, why should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Saying, this is saying, don't go try to say, oh, that, that's not really what I meant, God. I didn't, I didn't mean that. No, you cannot trick God. God knows everything, exactly what we are thinking, exactly how we feel. So don't go before the angel and say it was an error. Oh, that's not really what I meant. No, that's not going to fly because God knows exactly what you meant. And suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Let's read just a little bit more about that. Let's complete this study in James chapter 3. James, near the back of the Bible. We're going to go to James chapter 3. Pick it up, verse 1. We've got James right after the book of Hebrews, right before the book of 1 Peter. So we're going to go James chapter 3, verse 1. And it reads, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, what this is saying is that if, if you don't feel led to be a teacher by Almighty God, then, then you better not do it. Because what does this mean? We shall receive the greater condemnation. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, Judgment begins at the house of God. And there's a whole lot of people, oh, I want, I want to be a preacher. I mean, and that, that, that's a great thing. But you better know what you're talking about. You better teach God's word exactly as it's written. Or else, guess what? You're going to re receive the greater judgment. Judgment begins at the pulpit, at the house of God. So this is saying that not everyone is meant to be a teacher. I mean, God sends teachers. But he's saying, I, I didn't send every single one of you to be a teacher, but that's what you want to be. But if you decide to do that without teaching God's word, then you will receive judgment. So you want to be real careful. But if you feel led, by all means, follow what the Holy Spirit guides what you to do every time. Never quench the Spirit and never be afraid to teach God's Word because you know if you're teaching it exactly as it's written, you got nothing to worry about whatsoever. Verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. This means a complete man or a mature man and, and able also to bridle the whole body. You understand what that's saying? That's saying that if you can control what comes out of your mouth, control what you say, you can control your entire body. You can control the lusts of the flesh. I mean, if you have the ability, and it comes from God, gives you this ability over time, to control what you say at every turn, you can control everything about yourself. Verse 3. Behold, we, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we, and we turn about their whole body. Verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. The governor being the helmsman, the one that turns the ship. Verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member, member being a part of the body, and boasteth great things. This word boasted, this is the only place this Greek word is used in the entire Bible. It means to make wild claims. Behold, how great a matter a little fire, a little fire kindleth. And that's true. I mean, you could, you could just say one little thing and you use a certain tone. I mean, it could make somebody want to fight. I mean, how, how great a fire a little matter kindleth. I mean, you could say something that, and it could, it could just shatter somebody's self-esteem. I mean, it, it, could, it could make somebody feel horrible just by saying one or two words. So understand how powerful your words are. And you want to be real careful on what you say at every turn, basically. Verse 6. Or, yeah, yeah, verse 6. And the, tongue, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. It can cause you some real serious problems if you don't watch what you say. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and of bird and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. And don't forget, even you have power to tame the serpent, which is the devil himself. Christ gave you power over him in Luke 10, 19. Verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. 
It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And that is true if you don't have God. If you don't trust God, then yeah, you can't tame your tongue. But what, what does the God's Word say? It says, with God, all things are possible. So yeah, without God, you, you're never going to be able to control what you say. But if you have God with you, He gives you that ability over time. I mean, if you really work at it, you really try to tame what you say, God gives you the ability to do so. Verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. I mean, we, we are made even in, in the image of God in, our, in the spiritual bodies and the angels. And met, met God even made in God's image. I mean, how we have the same emotions that God has. And you want to praise God and then you want to curse men? God's saying you don't want to do that. We're all, we are all God's children. Verse 10 to complete. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. It is not good to, out of the same mouth to praise God and to curse others. That, that's not a good look. And, and also, I mean, if people hear you, I mean, the way you talk, that it, it has a great deal to do with your credibility. I mean, you want to be real careful how great a matter just a little fire kindleth. I mean, it can cause big, big problems. So this book of Ecclesiastes can just move right along here. And we're going to get to Solomon, how he's going to start to be optimistic. I mean, he's starting to come around. But so, so don't take these first few chapters that how, how Solomon is just talking about how, how he hates the world. Don't you be that way. Because remember, when he had that type of mindset, he was leaving God out of, out of the equation. But when you have God on your side and you always praise Him and you love Him, and you just do your very best, you will be so blessed and God will bring you so much happiness. You will have a better life than you ever even could have imagined. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You for this book of Ecclesiastes and for Your whole written Word that gives us so much good instructions on how to be a good Christian and how to be pleasing to You. And we just thank You for continuing to give us wisdom as, as we study Your Word. And we thank You for giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. And we thank You for giving us this building so we have a place to fellowship in Your name with others and to teach Your Word exactly as it's written. We thank You for allowing us to do that, Father. And we just ask You to continue to guide us with Your Holy Spirit to get wisdom from Your Word so we can share it with others and to be a good example to others to show them the life of, of You, Father. Thank You, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, Amen. This is recorded at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdom. Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless. September 2nd, 2019.